والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم Salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man ihtada bi huda. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met on the 11th year of the first Qur'an that was revealed to him with six men from Al-Khazraj tribe coming from Yathrib or what would be known in the future as Medina. He took from them the Pledge of Allegiance and they accepted it and he sent with them one of his best companions, Mus'ab ibn Umayr, to teach them the Qur'an, to lead them in prayer and to call others to Islam. Mus'ab ibn Umayr went with As'ad ibn Zurara who was with him and he stayed at his house. Together, they went from house to house, from tribe to tribe, calling people to come and join Islam. Islam. Once they went to the tribe of Bani Abdul Ashhal, and they gathered men to call them to Islam. Usaid ibn Hudayr and Sa'd ibn Mu'adh heard of this. Sa'd ibn Ma'adh, being the leader of Bani Abdul Ashhal, asked his friend Usaid ibn Hudayr to go, to go and deter them, to stop them from whatever they're doing. And he justified this by saying, you go because As'ad ibn Zirara happens to be my cousin and I cannot say bad things to my cousin. So Usaid took his spear and went there with one objective and one objective alone and that is to stop them and if he had to he would attack this foreigner who came from Mecca to spoil the men of Medina. The minute As'ad saw him coming he told his companion Mus'ab that be aware this man is one of the leaders of his people and if you do well with him, this would affect the others. Mus'ab could care less because he was doing Allah's work and he knew that Allah will support him. The minute, uh, the minute Usaid walked in, he started shouting, swearing, yelling at them and telling them to stop what they're doing. Very calmly, without shouting back. And this is how the Muslims should learn whenever they are presenting their case. Mus'ab ibn Umayr and As'ad ibn Zirara told him, why don't you sit down and let us present our case to you? If you see something you like, alhamdulillah, you accept it. If you don't, we will leave to the place we came from. How does this sound to you? Usaid ibn Hudayr was a logical person he was not like the pagans of Mecca. He said, this is only fair. I will sit and listen. He put his spear on the floor and he sat down as they explained Islam to him and recited some of the verses of the Quran. And immediately they could see it on his face. He said, what are the actions needed for those who wanted to embrace your religion so they told him it was easy go wash 
perform obligatory ablution, clean your clothes or wear uh, 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 clean clothes and say the testimony, Ashhadu la ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah. So he did that and he became a Muslim. And he told them that I'm going back to one of the greatest leaders of our tribes, to Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And if Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh reverts to Islam, you had, you have it made. So he went there. And Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was sitting on his companions. And the minute he saw Usaid ibn Hudayr coming, he told his companions, by Allah, he came with a different face than he left from here. This is not the same man. I can see it. I can, I can sense it. And subhanAllah, this is exactly what Islam does to people. It transforms them completely. To the good side, that is. And you may ask the parents that their children reverted to Islam. They will come to you and say, your religion is a great religion. My parents, my, my kids used to beat me. My kids used to uh, uh, shout at me. They never respected us. And now they are sp supporting us. They're giving us money. They're obeying whatever they say, whatever we say. And they give us the amount of respect that was not found there before. This is Islam. When a Muslim becomes a Muslim, he's 180 degrees or maybe 360 degrees transformation takes place at him. He becomes truthful. He becomes sincere. He never breaks a promise. He is not violent. He is not shouting. He tries his best to call others to Islam. This is exactly what Musab ibn Umayr did with Usaid ibn Hadayr. Usaid went to Sa'ad. And Sa'ad immediately began attacking. What have you done? So Usaid said, exactly as you told me. I went to them, I spoke with them, and they agreed to go away and not to continue what they're doing. So Sa'ad calmed down a little bit. But then Usaid told him, by the way, I heard that Bani Haritha, its a rival tribe, are trying to kill your cousin Asad ibn Zirara just to humiliate you. So I came immediately to tell you and warn you. Now, this was widely spread among the Arabs, as we said before. They had so much pride in them, and their relationship with their next of kin and relatives was so strong to the extent that they were ready to die defending their loved ones and their relatives, even if their relatives were the aggressors. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was furious when he heard that this tribe was about to attack his cousin in order to humiliate him. So he took his spear and went immediately to that location given to him by Usaid. And the minute he went in, he saw Mus'ab ibn Umayr and As'ad sitting among the men they were trying to call. He knew that he was tricked. He knew that he was fooled. Because if Usaid told him, go and listen to them, he would not have done this. So he had to trick him in this way. Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad started shouting, swearing, and yelling at them. And he addre was addressing his cousin As'ad because he felt that it was he that was preventing him from doing whatever he wanted. Because if he were not, if he was not to, to be there, he would, would, it would have been easy for him to kill Mus'ab ibn Umair, to attack him, to hit him, to do whatever he wanted. So As'ad said the same thing to him exactly. Told him, Sa'ad, my cousin, why don't you sit down? And listen to what we have to say. If you like it, alhamdulillah, that's great. If you don't, we will give you a promise that we will leave your city and village and you will not hear of us anymore. So Sa'ad, a logical person too, said, this is 
acceptable. He put his spear down and he sat down. And just as they were presenting him with Islam, reciting the verses of the Quran, what do you expect happened? The same thing happened with Usaid. He immediately showed it on his face, his acceptance of Islam. And he told him, what would a man do to embrace Islam? They told him, it's very simple. Say the Shahada, go have a total bath, change your clothing, and you are a Muslim. And this is exactly what he did. When talking about Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, it's not enough to mention his name in five minutes, ten minutes, half an hour. Sa'd ibn Mu'adh was one of the greatest companions of the Prophet ﷺ. He embraced Islam, went immediately to his house and to his people. He met his wife. He told her, what do you think of me? She told him, you're my husband. He told her, then I will not talk to you at all until you embrace the same religion. And she became a Muslim. He went in the same day to his people and gathered them. What do you think of me? They told him, you are our leader, you are our master. Then in that case, I will not talk to any one of you until I die, until you embrace the same religion that I have followed. And it was sunset all the people in his tribe converted and converted to Islam because of this single man, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. This man has wonders behind him. The Prophet والسلام, said that when he died, the throne of Allah Azza wa Jal trembled out of joy because he was coming to the heavens. Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad did in a number of years what a lot of men could not achieve in a lifetime. His age in Islam did not uh, uh, pass 10 years. He only was a Muslim for less than 10 years and then he died as a martyr. But look at his achievements, look at the support he gave to the Prophet and look at his fingerprints on his tribe where they all embraced Islam because of him. We have a short break, so stay tuned. If you're 18 or if you're 80, if you've been Muslim for 50 years or five minutes, this is a show for you. You know, when five times a day, I've, our foreheads touch the ground in prayer. We beg for what's most important in our lives. We want to be good people, better Muslims. We want to serve Allah Almighty with all our hearts. In this show, Let's Talk, every week we're going to talk about Islam and life, how to relate with other people and how to serve Allah. We'll have studio guests. We'll have a live studio audience. There'll be a, an email for you to write to, talk at huda.tv. So if you're looking for something different, looking for something that will make you think, maybe even touch your heart, this is the show for you. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was one of the greatest companions of the Prophet ﷺ. With less than 10 years in Islam, he made things that a whole tribe would not be able to achieve even if they spend their lifetime trying to. He was the main reason for his tribe, Bani Abdul Ashhal, to convert to Islam. He was one of the greatest supporters of the Prophet alayhi as -salatu was -salam. He was the Prophet's judge when an incident took place between the Prophet and the Jews. And he gave the verdict that Allah Azza wa Jal, as the Prophet told us, gave from above seven 
heavens. Sa'd ibn Mu'adh reverted to Islam and started also spreading Islam by himself. This was the case and the scenario on the 11th year and the months that followed where Mus'ab ibn Umair was paving the road for the Prophet ﷺ to come to Medina. Almost every house in Yathrib, which was to be called Medina afterwards, almost every house had Islam in it. And everyone knew what Islam was. And that is why on the 12th year of uh, 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 of of al hij of al bi'tha where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi sure. uh, uh, began being revealed to on the 13th year the 12th year we had the six men coming to the prophet sending musa ibn Umar with him on the 13th year which was months before the migration of the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and which was the last of him being in mecca 73 men came to the season of Hajj, of pilgrimage, and wanted oh, to give... Sheikh, before we start in this case, mm -hmm. I have a question. Okay. What is the difference between the, the people of Medina, Yisrib, and the Mecca? Because uh, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, stayed there 13 years, and they become Muslim very hardly. But Maaz and the people of Yisrib is become Muslim very easily. Mm. What's the difference? They are tolerated people? No, it's not this. It is due to the structural uh, 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 composition of Mecca. The people of Mecca, as you all know, were the descendants of Ishmael, which meant that mm. they've been living in Mecca for centuries and centuries, with their main objective was to care for the Kaaba and to uh, uh, receive the pilgrims that perform Hajj. So they had this honor in them of being the protectors and the keepers and the custodians of the Kaaba. That is why this prevented them from accepting another religion coming to them. And you have to remember that the people of Mecca did not accept Judaism because Judaism and Christianity came after Abraham. They remained worshipping on the Abrahamic religion. They didn't accept Christianity. So when the Prophet ﷺ came, though they knew he was truthful and what he was saying was the religion of Allah, yet they could not accept it because of their arrogance and because of their roots reaching to Ishmael. The people of Medina, on the other hand, were not as noble as the people of Quraysh. Secondly, they were expecting a messenger because of the threats of the Jews. The Jews keep, kept on threatening them that we will... Uh, kill you, we will attack you, we will wage war on you under the flagship of this messenger whose time is very close now. And that is why they were ready. Thirdly, they needed someone to unify them. While the people of Mecca, every tribe and every family had its leader and they were content, they were happy to be as they were. In this regard, the people of Medina, and, and, and above all, of course, Allah Azza wa Jal Almighty wanted the people of Medina to be the carrier of the message of the Prophet and he wanted them to be the supporters of the Prophet And that is why they are called Al-Ansar, Al -Ansar, Al -Ansar. which means that they are the supporters and the ones that uh, uh, assist the Prophet ﷺ in being victorious. On the 13th year, the people of Medina thought that it was not logical for the Prophet 
to be moving from one place to the other, feeding on his life, being uh, 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 susceptible for torture and humiliation. They thought this is unfair. Us being here in Medina, enjoying our lives with our children, safe and sound, while the Prophet is in uh, Mecca being tortured and humiliated. So they decided that to call the Prophet ﷺ to migrate to Medina. 73 men and two women. On the season of Hajj, on the season of pilgrimage, they came with their people from the Aus and from the Khazraj. They came among their tribes and they could have come among 300, 400 or more men and women for pilgrimage. But through the night, these 73 men and two women came out of their tents, you know, trying to go unnoticed to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet came with his uncle, Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, because Al-Abbas was afraid that they may do something wrong to him, though Al-Abbas was not Muslim at the time. So some narrations say, so the Prophet ﷺ met with them and heard what they had to say. They told him, O Prophet of Allah, we would like to give you our pledge of allegiance. And this was called the second pledge of allegiance of Al-Aqaba. And he took the oath from them that they should protect him and that they should support him and that they should comply with the instructions and orders of Islam. They accepted this and they wanted to give him the Pledge of Allegiance. When Asad ibn Zurara, who was working real hard to call all of them to Islam, stopped them and said, O oh people, watch out. We left Medina with one purpose and cause. We definitely know that he is the messenger of Allah. But now, before we give him the Pledge of Allegiance, you have to think twice. If you give him the Pledge of Allegiance, this means that you are putting yourself and your families in danger because all of Arabia will be against you. So think twice. They did not. They immediately told him, Asad, stay away from us. Let us take the Pledge of Allegiance from the Prophet ﷺ because we know that we are on the right track. Asad was not in doubt, but he wanted them to be sure once they give the Pledge of Allegiance that there's no going back. And the minute this took place, the Prophet ﷺ told them that, inshallah, if you fulfill what you have promised, then Allah will reward you with Jannah, with paradise. And this is all what they wanted. So they came to the Prophet ﷺ again and said, O Prophet of Allah, assuming that Allah Azza wa Jal grant you give victory, and we know He will grant you victory. We have treaties and we have allies from the Jews. Now, once you come to Medina, we're going to separate all these treaties and cancel them and we will detach ourselves from our allies, the Jews. So once we do this, we will be on our own. It's just a simple question. Would it be possible that if Allah Azza wa Jal grant you victory and people all accept your call, would it be possible that you will leave us and go back to your hometown? You go back to Mecca? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi smiled and said, never ever. I will always be with you till the day I die. It is the life that I lead in Medina that I will also conclude it in Medina. And this is what happened. This is exactly what happened. The Prophet ﷺ, after migration, he had the chance to stay in Mecca when Mecca was conquered on the... Which year was that? Which year? What? Fath Mecca. Uh, conquered uh, Mecca? Nine. It was not the ninth, it was eight, eight, the eighth. Eight, eight, eight. It was on eight the eighth of, of Hijrah, yeah. the Prophet 
uh, conquered Mecca. On that night, on that, on that year, he could have stayed in Mecca. And that was the concern of some of the Ansar, the people of Medina. When he conquered Mecca, they said, the Prophet ﷺ will forget you. Because now he has his city, he has his people and relatives, he will not come back to Medina. And once the Prophet ﷺ heard this, he comforted them and told them, no, I will come to Medina. This is my hometown, which is Medina. So the Prophet comforted them والسلام, and told them that uh, 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 he will stay in Medina and will not leave them at all. The minute this meeting concluded, Al-Abbas described this and said, say, by saying, I'm looking in their faces and I can't see anyone that I know, which means that they were all young in age. They were the youth and not the elderly. And again, this is one of the things that we should always concentrate on, is that Islam is greatly accepted by the youth and not by the elderly. Because old people are born and raised on the customs and the traditions that they find it difficult for them to abandon and leave. And that is why Abu Talib did not accept Islam. While the youngsters are in the mood of change, mm -hmm. they would like to accept anything that they are convinced with. And they are strong in their in belief. The minute they believe in something, they go all the way to back it up. And that is exactly what happened with these Ansar, those who came from Medina. They went back to their tents. But the pagans heard about this attempt. There are narrations that Satan himself went to the pagans and shouted to them, haven't you heard what happened with Muhammad and those who came from Medina? So the following day in the morning, the dignitaries of Mecca went to the tents of the people coming from Yathrib, from, from Medina. And they spoke with the leaders, the first generation. Have you met Muhammad Has he proposed to you? Did you accept his proposal? And the leaders who did not attend last night's meeting swore by Allah that nothing of this happened and that they did not meet anyone. And this was truth because they did not meet the Prophet. It was the second generation who met the Prophet I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. So until we meet next time, inshallah, I say fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.